Hello and welcome to This Is Us. I'm Becca King-Reed. This week, we are at the Emma Pruch Farm Park near downtown San Jose. This was an actual working farm from 1870 to 1969, and it's a great place to bring kids to get that farm experience. We're gonna play with some animals, not just these guys, real farm animals, and we're going to give you a look at life on the farm. We'll also meet two local human rights advocates who spent their lives battling injustice. Playwright and film director Luis Valdez, the man behind the film Zoot Suit and La Bamba, who grew up near here, the child of migrant farm workers. You'll also meet activist and attorney Carol Ruth Silver. During the early days of the civil rights movement, she was one of the original freedom riders who boarded buses in an attempt to end discrimination. We've got some great stories to share, and it all starts now. This is us. Welcome back to the Emma Cruz Farm in near downtown San Jose. Joining me is Alex Pearson. And Alex, you're the supervisor here of the park, correct? Yes, I'm the supervisor. Now, I want to hear all about the park, but first, I want to hear about Emma. Tell me who she was. Well, Emma was a dairy woman who owned the farm here. She inherited it from her father in the 1800s. Uh, she loved the city. She loved children. Children loved her. When she was getting older in years, she saw the development happening. She left this, city, uh, this land to the city so we could open a park for children. Wow, and so now I know it's a park and it's a farm. So what kind of farm things go on here? Well, we have school children raising cows, pigs, and goats, and then our own uh, recreational programs, they're doing the same thing. They're raising chickens and rabbits and goats. Oh, that's wonderful. And you have a big park here with a playground and everything. Tell me a little about that. Yeah, the part playground behind me is uh, here for the community. Uh, children come out here every evening of the week and they're busy here until it gets dark uh, playing around while their parents are walking around on the pathway. I know you can also have a garden here. Uh, we have two community gardens for a total of about 85 garden spaces through the San Jose Community Garden Program. You sign up, you pay for a water fee and you can grow all your family's vegetables here. That is so wonderful. It's That's wonderful. so nice. How big is this farm? It's uh, 47 and a half acres and it was originally 86 acres. Wow, so it's a pretty big farm. It was a dairy farm. It really wasn't growing crops in the day. That's right. This whole side of town were dairy farms. All four corners at one time of Story and King were dairy farms. Okay, well I understand you have some exotic pigs here and I would love to see them. Can we take a look at your potbelly pigs? Yes, we can. Let's go. <laughs> okay. Okay, so Alex, this, uh, this is great. It looks like the classic barnyard right out of a storybook. That's right, we call this the small animal area. Kids must love this. Uh, they do, and they get to uh, become involved in the raising of the animals as well. So this is, these are your potbelly pigs? These are the Vietnamese miniature potbelly pigs. This is Rachel and Hamlet. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so so they're, they're tiny compared to normal sized pigs, which are how big? Uh, here at the park, the breeding sows can be as big as 400 pounds. So these are much better for children to be playing with. The, uh, they're the right size for our classes. Right. So what do they get to do? How do they interact with these pigs? Well, uh, our summer camp children and the children in the hatchery program will become, uh, uh, they'll, they'll get to feed the pigs. Uh, they'll get to clean up after them, as fun as that is. Uh, and then all the other animals, the goats that we have, they'll get to care for those as well. And the chickens and the ducks and the geese. So they well. really get a farm life experience. Absolutely, they do. That is so fun. <laughs> Thanks for bringing me to the barnyard. Of course. We'll be back in a minute with more of the farm, but first, John Gregg has the story of a local man who's made a name for himself in Hollywood and on Broadway, but got his start right here in the orchards of San Jose. For the last five decades, writer Luis Valdez has worked to give a voice to the voiceless. I don't think any of these places really speak of prosperity or security of any sort. None of those guys that live in the conditions that they expect Mexicans or farm workers to uh, live in. This town is way off the freeway, so you never see it. And, and people aren't, aren't wise to the fact that thousands and thousands of people are living like this. And they're farm workers. I mean, I can remember this when I was a kid. We used to do this. Just settle for anything. Celebrated playwright and director Luis Valdez is best known for plays like Zoot Suit, 
and films such as La Bamba and is the founder of El Teatro Campesino, the workers' theater. However, his life was shaped and forged as the son of migrant farm workers in the 1940s of Central California. I was born in Delano, California, southern San Joaquin Valley, headed up north all the way up to Santa Rosa and then back down again. Um, San Jose was uh, a tremendous crossroads then. Of course, it was the Garden of Eden in those days. It was uh, nothing but orchards. Uh, it was a community. It was a migrant community on wheels, on trucks and in pickups and in cars. Uh, in some cases, you were homeless. You lived in your cars. You lived in your vehicles, you know, waiting to pick up a labor camp or what have you. On the other hand, uh, it was uh, in an area of the world, the, San, the Santa Clara Valley, uh, which was very pleasant, actually, as, as life goes. It was quite possible to live under the trees there, which is what we did, lived in tents. Valdez's family eventually settled in San Jose, and he was such an outstanding student at James Lick High School that he earned an academic scholarship studying mathematics and physics at San Jose State College. However, theater and performance always seemed to call to him, and Valdez switched his major to English, and after graduation, he spent time with the San Francisco mime troupe, in 1965, Valdez returned to Delano, and with the blessing of Cesar Chavez, El Teatro Campesino was born. So I decided that what I wanted to do was to organize a theater of, by, and for farm workers. And so in the second week of the Delano grape strike, I went to Delano to see Cesar. And didn't get a chance to talk to him then, but I, I eventually caught up with him and pitched him this idea. And he said, um, well, it's a good idea, he says, but you know, there's no money in Delano. He said, there's no actors in Delano. Uh, certainly there's no money to do theater in Delano. There's no, there's no time, there's no theater, there's no, there's no even time to rehearse. We're on the picket line every day, night and day. He says, you still want to do it? And I said, absolutely, Caesar. what an opportunity. And so it was really the spirit of the strike and the movement that, that um, inspired me. And um, I created El Teatro Campesino with the farm workers on the picket lines. It was a form of expression, a form of protest, but also a form of entertainment all at once. We used to hop on top of uh, an old panel truck that the union had, later on flatbed trucks. It became a form of really organizing people and expressing really what the needs were, a nonviolent form of organization, and that was really important and part of that whole chain. Valdez continued to write and work with El Teatro Campesino, and 1977 proved to be a watershed year. His play Zoot Suit was a smash success at the Mark Taper Forum in Los Angeles, and the guy who once performed atop flatbed trucks hit the big time. We ran at almost 100% capacity for 11 months, which was just phenomenal. It made enough money for the Mark Taper Forum to purchase the Aquarius Theater. Uh, over a half a million people saw it, and uh, it still holds the record for the longest running locally produced uh, hit play in the history of uh, Los Angeles theater. Unwilling to sell the movie rights of his play for a cool half million dollars, Valdez instead wrote his own screenplay and ended up directing the film for considerably less cash. But he had his foot in the door as a director and a number of Latino film careers were launched. Que pues no what the hell's going on, is it? City's cracking down on Pachucos, carnal. Don't you read the newspaper? Death awakens, Sleepy Lagoon. So what emerged was a film that was kind of unusual and uh, I think holds up well. It, uh, it's still very popular. It won me more respect, I think, with filmmakers. It was not a commercial success, but it was nominated for a Golden Globe as Best Musical Picture of 1981 or something. And, um, and the fact is that uh, it's still there. And, uh, it's a record, if nothing else, of uh, the original cast. It made Eddie Olmos a movie star. And my brother was also, Daniel, was one of the major figures in it. Uh, Lupe Ontiveros, who played the mother, also had a major, still has a major career in Hollywood. Tony Plana, who was the father in Ugly Betty, was one of the younger brothers. So the Zoot Suit cast uh, had their opening, their shot with Zoot Suit. Bye.
What followed was even more success for Valdez, and in 1987 he wrote the screenplay and directed the blockbuster film La Bamba, the tragic story of rock and roller Richie Valens, whose life was cut short in a plane crash. 20 years later, the film still resonates with audiences, largely because of Valdez's ability as a master storyteller. I was trying to tell a story that was true to Richie's spirit. He would have been very generous. He was a very generous person, very loving person, uh, who uh, encountered uh, a world that he changed uh, through his music. Um, the heartline of La Bamba, I think, is what, is what keeps it popular. The fact that it's, uh, it's a story of, of two brothers. It's a Cain and Abel story. There's nothing that's biblical. That goes way back. And when two brothers can, because of jealousy and anger or whatever, you know, uh, those roots that come out of childhood and, and manifest in different ways in adulthood, uh, in some ways a competition for mama's love, you know, what could be more basic than that? Don't you walk out on me! Valdez would continue to work, and in 1987 he was honored with a George Peabody Award for Excellence in Television for Corridos, Tales of Passion and Revolution for PBS. Along the way, there would be other writing and directing jobs, including the Cisco Kid. Are you afraid to die? I'd rather live. Me too. But what remained closest to his heart has always been El Teatro Campesino and their theater in San Juan Batista. Recently, Valdez has allowed local high school students to use his groundbreaking play Zoot Suit in an effort to promote the arts and theater in schools. The idea of having my play, Zoot Suit, being done in high school, particularly in this area, uh, was phenomenal. It was a learning experience for the students. Uh, I mean, I wasn't directly involved. These were other directors. I just gave them permission to do my play. We had some of the Teatro Campesino members go over and work with the students. But it was a transformative experience for a lot of these young people. Not all the Latinos either. I mean, it was the Anglicans involved because this was the first time that they really interacted and that they were able to really look across and see each other. Being high school, they had to have colorblind casting, so uh, even the Pachuco, the Eddie Olmos role, was played by a young woman, you know, in uh, April Saldana in, in Salinas High School, which was incredible. Here's this young woman uh, doing El Pachuco, and she did a hell of a job. So it's a learning experience for everybody. And in that way, uh, the work is able to serve. I've always believed that theater is a creator of community and that community is a creator of theater. I'm of the belief that every community, regardless of economic status, should have access to a theater. I am the ballad, and the ballad sings. And my voice is of the streets and the cantinas and the dance halls and all the places where I am heard. For I am the soul of the common people that sings of tragedies and melancholy, but also happiness. <laughs> Ora muchachos, adentro! Some men are timeless, and such is the case with Luis Valdez, a playwright and director who continues to tell stories and give voice to the voices. Welcome back to the Emma Proust Farm and Park. Joining me now is Mark Maderos from Veggie Lucian. Mark, tell us what Veggie Lucian is all about. Great, yeah, so Veggie Lucian is a large community garden where any San Jose resident can come and participate, work for a few hours, and take home food for free. Now this is a sustainable farm, so tell us a little bit what that means. Yeah, so we're very committed to organic, gardening or farming practices. We use animal manures, we don't use any chemicals, and we teach people how to do this so that they could go home and garden organically at home. Now you invite students as well. Tell us a little bit about your official programs. Yeah, so we have a high school youth program. That's our coolest program, I think, and we'll bring 20 high schoolers from mostly the east side neighborhood to learn about gardening, nutrition, and then social and environmental issues related to agriculture all throughout the summer and the spring. So how big a garden is this? Well, right now it's the winter and we're growing about uh, one acre of winter veggies. But last year we were on two acres. We produced around 22,000 pounds of food. So um, hopefully we expand in 
in future years. So. Okay. So you're not all outdoors. You also have a website. Is that right? Yes. Our website is vegilution.org, and there you could see our workday schedule, and you could read about all of our educational programs. If you have kids, or maybe you're an adult and you want to participate in one of our workshops, so. Okay, so all the information there on the website? Yep. Okay, well, that's great. Well, I'm going to take off now. I've got to go see Alex in the barn, but it's been a pleasure. Thanks great. very much. Nice to meet you. Bye-bye. Hey, Alex. Who's your pal? Hi, Becca. This is Sylvester. Oh, Sylvester. Well, he's a very curious, he's a curious boy, isn't he? He is. Uh, so is he the property of a 4-H member? That, yes, he is. Uh, so 4-H uh, high school and junior high school students uh, raise animals like this here at the farm. Oh, this is great. So this is a great barn. It really gives them a great, they couldn't do this normally in a city. That's right. This is a historic design, but it's a new construction. It was completed in uh, about 1982. Wow. So how many can this hold at a time? Well, we have eight steer pens, so we can hold about 24 steer, uh, about uh, 15 to 20 uh, goats and sheep, and about another uh, 20 pigs. So is there a program for, for people to raise animals here after they've grown up and they're no longer in 4-H? Yeah, 4-H is exclusively for people up till age 18. After age 18, we still allow them to raise their animals here uh, if they're in the super steer project at the county fair. This is excellent. We'll be back in a minute with a look at some very special orchards. But first, John Gregg has the story of a local woman who spent most of her life fighting for justice. people get, getting beaten, we wanted to rush out and stand between the aggressors and the people uh, getting, getting hurt, um, and we wanted to, to stop that. And the only way that we could do it was by putting our bodies on the line. Activist, lawyer, politician, and true believer, Carol Ruth Silver has spent a lifetime putting her voice and her body on that line, fighting injustice. In 1961, Silver was among the 450 people that volunteered to ride buses south with the Congress of Racial Equality as a freedom rider. When I called CORE, they said, uh, are you sure you want to do this? And I said, yes. And they said, have you made your will? And I said, no. Then they said, you better do that now. With the threat of violence, an ominous and gut-churning possibility, Silver signed her will and then boarded a bus bound for Atlanta. They took me to a, uh, the home of a, uh, an African-American family that was willing to put up Freedom Riders at, at great you know, great danger to themselves. Silver joined five other Freedom Riders, two white and three black divinity students, on a bus bound for Mississippi, with the rest in jail facing them at the end of the line. When we got to Jackson, the city of Jackson, uh, the bus driver stopped and he said, he said something to the effect of, you're on your own, got off the bus and disappeared. What we could see out the windows was a large crowd. We held hands for a minute, shook each other's hands, and we got off the bus. The white guys and I headed toward the sign that said colored waiting room. We were confronted by a large Mississippi trooper, very authoritatively, saying, um, y'all move on. And I, my recollection is that uh, I said, I just wanted to use the restroom. And he said, y'all move on. And I said, I'm sorry. And he said, y'all under arrest. Um. 
Silver was sent to the infamous Mississippi Penitentiary, known as Parchment Farm, and placed in maximum security. Tuesday, June 27, 1961. Today is the fourth day that we've been without combs or had showers. Uh, this was because we were being punished for singing. Silver would spend 40 days behind bars, and to keep her spirits up, she wrote a diary on scraps of paper she hid in a Bible. She managed to write using lead that she chewed from a pencil. She documented her time behind walls, including an incident involving noted civil rights activist Ruby Dora Smith. They grabbed her and they put these uh, pressure cuffs on her. When they brought her back, she was stumbling a little. Shirley told us that they had taken her into the shower, turned the water on a couple of times, and scrubbed her down with a floor brush, concentrating specially on the sensitive areas of the skin. They had also knocked her down a couple of times while they continued to hold on to the pressure cuffs. We were all, especially Terry and I, who had seen the dark welts on Ruby's wrists burning with anger and frustration. Our subdued comments to each other and down the cell block to girls in the other cells were distinctly unprintable. But then, from Ruby, lying on the top bunk in her cell, in her soft drawl, began a lecture on Christian brotherhood and love and how we must not hate because that is a victory for the evil forces which we are fighting. She talked of mental nonviolence, which is just as important as physical nonviolence, of returning love for hate, sympathy for oppression. These women were not evil, only their actions were evil, she said, and what we must do is to hate the sin and love the sinner. I had never been this so close before to this kind of religious feeling, and in a sense, I could not really understand it. But for the rest of the day, I lay on my stomach thinking about it, and very late, after everyone else seemed to be asleep, I began to feel, finally, that I did not hate the woman who had done it. And maybe, maybe I did not hate Sergeant Story. Wednesday, June 28th, 1961. Her mother bailed her out of jail. Carol would go on to earn a law degree from the University of Chicago in 1964, and she continued to work with the civil rights movement, helping to register voters and train other attorneys. Eventually, she headed west and became involved in politics, and she served three terms as a member of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. History and Carol Ruth Silver crossed paths once more, when her name ended up on a killer's list, tragically, on the morning of November 27th, 1978. Code 3, room 200. Come in the mayor's office. As president of the Board of Supervisors, it's my duty to make this announcement. Both Mayor Moscone and Supervisor Harvey Milk have been shot and killed. Oh, the suspect is Supervisor Dan White. There were 11 members of the Board of Supervisors, and Harvey sat on my right, and Dan White sat on my left. Then uh, there came a time when Dan White resigned his position, tried to get it back, and the mayor refused to reappoint him, and uh, Dan took out his revolver and went down to City Hall and shot the mayor shot Harvey Milk, would have shot me if I'd been around. Thank goodness I was off somewhere else uh, uh, with a constituent having a, a, a last half a cup of coffee uh, that saved my life. More than 30 years since that tragic day, Silver still has fond memories of her friend, Harvey Milk. Harvey was uh, a wonderful, gentle, comic, strong uh, human being and uh, my friend, and it, it, was, it was devastating. Silver has never wavered in her belief of service. After retiring from politics, she founded San Francisco's Chinese American International School in 1982. In 2002, she made her first trip to Afghanistan and has worked tirelessly, returning to that war-torn country a number of times, promoting education for young women and girls. The things that I've done to uh, help with education in Afghanistan 
have taken many forms or a number of different forms. One is that Afghan Friends Network uh, is uh, helping girls in Ghazni, which is south of Kabul, um, who graduate from high school but don't have enough education to get into the university uh, to give them uh, tutoring and, and help them to, uh, to be able to do that. Um, the other thing that I'm doing right now is working with One Laptop Per Child, which is a, uh, an organization, the program of putting laptop computers in schools where uh, children will then have an opportunity to get a much better education through the use of modern technology. The lessons learned as a freedom writer 50 years ago have resonated with Carol Rue Silver her entire life, a life that has been spent fighting injustice. It stayed with me my entire life and in fact was kind of a defining moment because it was the moment when I discovered that I had within me the sense of rightness and righteousness that I needed in this life and that nobody else could tell me what was right and what was wrong. In 1964, President Lyndon Johnson signed the historic Civil Rights Act, a landmark piece of legislation that prohibited major forms of discrimination, including racial segregation, based on the color of a person's skin. Alex, I can't help but notice, since there's no foliage on the trees in this orchard, that they're all painted white. What's the point of that? Uh, that's a sun protection. So in the winter, the leaves fall off the trees. They don't provide natural sun protection to the tree. So the volunteers paint the trunks white. So they have a little sunscreen. It's exactly what it is. <laughs> now, what, what's growing here normally? They all look like different trees. Uh, there's, uh, we, we're growing peaches and apricots, nectarines, figs. In many cases, we're growing three or four varieties of that one fruit on one tree through grafting. Wow. And are these special in any way? Uh, they're special because we're keeping alive certain varieties that are no longer popular commercially or grown by homeowners any longer. So they're like heirloom? They're heirloom, and in some cases, we have the single variety that we know is still in existence. Oh, so a nice preservation project then. Yes, it is. Now you have some other interesting projects here involving orchards. Tell me about those. Here we have a high density orchard where we're planting four trees in one hole to show what you can do in a dense urban environment. And we have the Friendship Forest, which is a project of the Friendship Force, an international delegation of uh, volunteers that will visit here and plant a tree. Oh, that's a nice sign of friendship. Yes, it is. Well, thanks for being a friend to us and allowing us to come down on the farm right. for a day. You're more than welcome. For all of us at This Is Us, from the Emma Pruche Farm in San Jose, I'm Becca King-Reed saying good night. This is us. This is us.